Hello, my name is Shelley Shaner Gurton, and I'm here to tell my story. On April 17, 2020, my older brother died of the COVID-19 plague. Um, but this is not a sad story. It's about him and it's really a happy story. My brother who was born, Ivan Shaner, changed his name unofficially to Gene Shea when he went into broadcasting. Uh, so I will probably refer to him as Ivan because that's how I know him, my brother. Um, he was born in Philadelphia and stayed there his whole life. He was really a local hero in Philadelphia. So when he died, there were many articles about him and interviews and very long um, obituary articles that told about his career and all the many things he did that made himself so beloved in that city that it was amazing. Now, I'm not going to really talk about his career. You can find that on Wikipedia or on his Facebook page. I want to talk about growing up with Jean, that's his stage name, and how did this come about? Well, when all the publicity was going on about his death, uh, I got a phone call from somebody who tracked me down as his younger sister, and she said, um, that she was the manager of a folk music website and would I agree to talk about growing up with Jean? And I said, sure. And so that afternoon she called me again and I just started talking. And what you're going to hear now is, um, came from that originally. So, I was four years younger and so I really didn't get to know him uh, until he was probably seven or eight when I figured out what was going on in my life. He was a very funny, cheerful, upbeat kid from the, from, I wasn't there, but everybody said so. But as, and I, as I knew him, he was the same. Now, it was ordained that he was going to go into broadcasting because as a kid at the kitchen table, at breakfast, he would hold the milk carton and he would sometimes hold a spoon as a microphone and he would read every drop of Sylvan Seal Extra Rich Milk will provide your family with the vitamins and minerals they need for a healthy life. And I heard that every single day at breakfast, so that's how I can, in my 80s now, I can remember it. And he was always being funny, making jokes, twisting things around, making puns. He was just a, a humorist, as well as a broadcaster. So it was a lot of fun growing up in his household. And I'll talk a lot about his humor, but I want to bring up another subject, a way in which he enriched my life and the life of my younger sister as well. And that is he brought music into our household my parents were content to listen to the radio and whatever was on, if it was a talk show or a music show, it didn't matter, they enjoyed it. But my brother, as he became a teen, began to recognize that there were certain kinds of music that he really loved. And it started with show music, Rogers and Hammerstein, Carousel, Oklahoma, um, South Pacific. And so he began buying those records and bringing them into the house, as well as um, Gilbert and Sullivan. So right there, he started shaping my musical taste and that of my sister. Um, after that, he began to focus on modern jazz, and that included Dave Br Brubeck, uh, Chris Connor, Peggy Lee, Chet Baker, and all the other wonderful uh, musical performers. Uh, after that, he kind of morphed into um, folk music, and that became the focus of his musical interests for the rest of his life. Although he never really dropped all of the others. So our home was filled 
with beautiful and interesting music, and that became a lifelong um, source of enjoyment for myself and my sister as well. So that was very important in my life with Gene. Um, and he also would tell jokes, not so much jokes, but quips. So I don't think I told you yet that my parents ran a uh, ladies' wear store uh, specializing in lingerie um, on Germantown Avenue in Philadelphia. And my brother loved that idea. And so he was always glad to tell people, well, you know, my father is in ladies' underwear. And then when falsies became, came into the marketplace, my brothers told my parents, why don't you put a sign in the window that says, we fix flats, which of course they did not do, but we all got a laugh out of it. Um, so again, he was making people laugh and uh, that went on. And he played little jokes on people. You could say with the beginnings of practical jokes. For example, um, I would, went to write in my diary and I found a note in it that said, I read this very interesting with an exclamation point. And of course he hadn't, but he was just doing it to annoy me. Um, and sometimes when I opened my jewelry box where I kept my allowance, um, I'd see a note saying, thank you very much, the movie was great, and there'd be five dollars missing. Um, and why am I saying this with a smile on my face? Because I just couldn't get mad at him. He was so much fun. So even when I was a victim, it was okay. Um, he had a bunch of guys who were his buddies, as many teenage boys do, and they would often congregate in our family room on a weekend night, and they would do, their activity was called messing around. And they were all funny. And they made jokes, they made parodies of uh, songs or song titles. They practiced something called double talk, which is um, inventing syllables that have no meaning in themselves, but they sound like words. They sound like parts of words. And if you say them with inflection, I wish I could do it now, but I can't, um, it sounded like they're actually saying something. It makes people listen until they realize that they're doing double talk. And um, if you remember, Sid Caesar and Danny Kay were both really good at that. And my brother listened to a lot of other comedians and he picked up their, their uh, techniques and enjoyed them. The other thing he did, and he did with these guys, was magic tricks. He had a big supply of what he called whiffle dust, and he had many incantation forms of abracadabra, and he would make things happen, pull quarters out of your ears and so forth. Well, you know, I was a little too old for it by the time he got good at it, but all the nieces, nephews, cousins, they all couldn't wait for Uncle Ivan to come over and pull a quarter out of their ears. Uh, so he just kept everybody laughing with these jokes and tricks. Um, I'll tell you now about some of the, um, you would call practical jokes, but they're very witty. Um, and I enjoy them when they happened, and I, pr pretty much, unless I was a victim, um, and um, I hope that you'll enjoy hearing about them too. Um, he, being in broadcasting, and by this time he was, uh, had a radio show from Temple University, and um, uh, their radio station, and he played jazz, if I recall correctly, again on Sunday nights. Um, and so he had access to props and gimmicks. So this time he had a telephone. Now, this, you have to put yourself in the days before cell phones. He had a, a, a table telephone, traditional dial with a handset. He had one that was not attached, it was not, not real, but he could make it ring. And I think it was a stage prop from um, one of the drama courses that he took. So, if you can picture this, 
Uh, he invited me on a ride down Broad Street on a spring evening when the windows could be open, no car air conditioning then. Um, and he was riding shotgun, the right hand seat, and when it lined up just right and there was a green light, he stopped and of course the car next to us stopped. The windows were down, he took the phone out and the driver of the car over there was looking at this traditional phone that he's holding and then he makes it ring. Startled and he hands it, he doesn't actually give it to him, but he hands it out the window and he says to the driver over there, it's for you. Well, that was a ride in, in our car at least. I don't know <laughs> if those other people probably called the police. Anyway, so those are the kinds of things that he uh, loved to do. Um, I'll, I don't want to miss telling you this one because uh, uh, it may take a little while. Okay, so uh, I think we're going to have to go back a few years to when he's 12 and I'm 8 and we were at Camp Cahagan, we were where we went every year, the three of us, and we loved that camp. And a lot, there were a lot of stories that take place there. Um, so he's a, a, an older camper, and and I, well, I said he's 12, I'm eight, and we are permitted to make a phone call home, which is very unusual. They didn't want kids calling their parents, but. He was very seductive and he could talk people into things. So we, we were there. And I heard him talking to my parents. I only heard his side of the conversation and I did not understand it then, but I understood it later. All right, this is what he was saying. Don't forget, my parents had a lingerie store. He's saying, yes, on visiting day, Please bring up 12 pair. Yes, 12 pair. My counselors will pay for them, I promise you. If you bring them, they will pay for them. They want them. No, I'm not joking. Bring them on visiting day, okay? Promise me you will. Fine, so I'm listening to that, not understanding what it is he wants. Okay, now it's my turn. I get on the phone and say, hi. Yes, I love it, I love swimming and on visiting day, bring me seedless green grapes. That's what I wanted, a lot more practical uh, requests. Okay, so visiting day comes and goes, and then gradually, in the weeks after that, certain things start showing up on the campus, and they happen to be falsies, if you know what I'm talking about. Flat-chested women, remember we fix flats? Okay, so these were not like they are today. These were beautiful models, beige or sort of skin color, foam rubber, beautiful shape, little nipple on top of each one, and of course they came in pairs, so he had, his counselors had a dozen, and they kept showing up all over camp floating in the swimming pool right before swim time, um, on the rope of the flagpole when it was time to raise the flag in the morning, um, and the best, oh, two, two more locations. One was, um, took place in the dining room when one of the female counselors had a birthday, and traditionally, the birthday person got up on a chair and the whole camp sang happy birthday to that person. Everybody clapped, the person went down and enjoyed um, birthday cake. Okay, this time, as this female, I wish I could remember her name, um, is up there, uh, a young camper comes and hands her a gift, wrapped beautifully, wrapping paper, and some people at their table start chanting, Open it, open it, open it. And of course the whole camp starts chanting, open it. And she opens it and looks. And of course, you know what's in there. And she was horrified and slapped it closed and, and hustled to get down off that chair and back to her table. And people were still 
chanting, show us, show us, show us. But of course, she had no intention of doing that. So at, at some point I began to realize this is what my brother was asking my parents to bring on visiting day. The last time that I saw them was uh, that year the camp was giving, uh, my brother was putting on um, HMS Pinafore as the big extravaganza show that he was, um, at that point he was the drama counselor. And when um, the Admiral, Sir Joseph, comes on the scene, he, of course he's wearing an Admiral's jacket and it has to have epaulettes on the shoulders, so they made use of those falsies as epaulettes. Now I am looking back on it now, I think, how did the camp leadership let him get away, let the counselors get away with that? They would never, I mean, it was, it's flabbergasting, but everybody loved it. They had a good time and it, it was great. Um, so there are a lot more stories uh, that I could tell you, and I'll, when I see you, if you ask, I'll be happy to tell you more of the um, jokes and uh, joy and happiness that uh, was part, for me and others, that was part of growing up with Jean. Thank you.